Hello, everyone. I'm Patty Pelica, editor in chief of Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography. Welcome to Author Spotlight. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Sharif Nega. Sharif is the chair and lead author of the ASC Guidelines and Standards document published this month. The document is recommendations for the evaluation of left ventricular diastolic function by echocardiography and for HEPPEF diagnosis, an update from the American Society of Echocardiography. Welcome, Sharif. Thanks for joining. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today and to speak with the JACE readers. So this is an update to the 2016 version of the diastolic function guidelines. What can our readers expect to see in this document? Um, so it goes over uh, sort of what is diastolic function. So one has a good perspective when we talk about non-invasive measurements. What is the invasive gold standard? Uh, this could be a quick read for those who uh, may not be interested that much, but for those who want to know uh, more of the foundation of what is diastolic function, that section will be helpful. Uh, the document then goes to the standard measurements uh, that are obtained by echocardiography, uh, including the developments in the field since the last update in 2016. This is presented mostly in table formats uh, with nice figure examples within the tables, how to acquire these signals, how to measure them, what are the limitations of uh, each particular signal, what are situations uh, where we should not rely on these signals, and so on. There is a supplemental file uh, that has in-depth uh, more technical aspects about left ventricular strain measurements and left atrial strain measurements. So we do not end up with a very large document, but for those who want to go more about technical details, they'll find that in the supplemental file. Uh, in comparison with previous updates, we have a section on normal values based on a meta-analysis. One of the writing group members, Dr. Amil Shah, uh, who is at UT Southwestern, and his group worked on that. Uh, we present uh, the results of that analysis, and based on which we uh, define what is normal, what is a normal diastolic function. Again, uh, the main document has a summary, the supplemental uh, file that will accompany the document. It uh, goes in more details about the process, how this was done, and when uh, if you would, analysis. Uh, it's a great document. The tables, as you point out, are beautiful. And the illustrations and Doppler images within those tables are um, extremely nicely done. Thank you. Uh, it was a lot of effort. I will say the sonographer uh, members uh, of the document, and Ms. Carol Mitchell, Ms. Monita Anderson, and Ms. Kristen uh, Belchick from... Uh, Scripps Clinic did a great job uh, on these sections. Uh, then the biggest or the, the most, uh, I guess, awaited part is the new approach to assess uh, left ventricular filling pressures, primarily really left atrial pressure. Um, the group worked hard to get something that is practical, highly feasible, low yield of indeterminate calls, um, and at the same time include the, uh, some of the more newer measurements. Um, we worked hard not just in developing that algorithm, but also verifying that it works and how it performs uh, with other approaches to assess, to assess filling pressures using actual invasive data. I would say this is a big difference uh, from previous documents, which were mostly opinion-based. This, I'm happy to say, is opinion-based and evidence-based, tested. Uh, after that, we talk about special populations like atrial fibrillation, uh, pulmonary hypertension, valvular heart disease, and so on. And again, there have been some developments since 2016, so the reader 
uh, would be advised to sort of look at these uh, more carefully. We have nice algorithms for these uh, specific situations that they can look at. And the last piece is the first time where uh, ASE uh, guidelines document talks about heart failure preserved ejection fraction uh, diagnosis, and we worked on that as a group uh, with Dr. Kavita Sharma, who was uh, nominated to the writing group from the Heart Failure Society. Uh, so that's sort of in summary uh, what's in this document. I forgot to mention that there is an AI section as well. Uh, it's a brief mention of what was done, but then uh, more of what is to be expected uh, and what may be coming down the line here. Excellent. Yeah, the AI application is really exciting and could potentially simplify a lot of assessments. The um, LA strain is something that is new in this document, right? Um, and there's quite a, an emphasis on that in practice and also in the papers that we're getting for Jays. Um, you also refer to LV global longitudinal strain in the document. Tell us a little bit about how LA strain should fit into our um, armamentarium of assessment tools for diastology. The available uh, ultrasound systems all of them now would allow that to be uh, performed once the images have been acquired. In our lab, and I suspect in most labs, sonographer scanning patients will uh, perform this analysis and will include it among with the other image files. So uh, the reader, once they have satisfactory data, can look at these. And I would say for labs that do it routinely, not just an as-needed basis, the yield of LA strain is high. Uh, the document talks about how to acquire these signals, what are the different, uh, we, I guess you can say, items of LA strain that we measure. We have reservoir strain, pump strain, and conduit strain. Most of the data that has been published uh, focused on LA reservoir strain, and that's the metric uh, that uh, is recommended in the guidelines uh, for estimation of mean left atrial pressure in the algorithm. Uh, left atrial strain, as many of Jay's readers, I suspect, know is inversely related to the pressures, to the filling pressures. The higher these are, the lower the reservoir strain. Um, and so um, that's sort of where we say it can be used. But aside from just using uh, LA strain to say what LA pressure is, um, it is important to recognize that patients with uh, diastolic dysfunction, as well as patients with heart failure preserved ejection fraction, can have an abnormal LA strain at the time when their mean pressure is, could be normal. Um, and so the document looks at LA structural and functional abnormalities as indicators of left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. In general, left atrial strain is a better marker of filling pressures when the ejection fraction is depressed. It is less accurate in patients with a normal ejection fraction. The cutoff value that provides the highest specificity is a cutoff value of 18%. Uh, part of the struggle the writing group had was, uh, should we recommend higher cutoff values? Then when you look at what is published in terms of normal values, you can see normal individuals, both men and women, uh, with values in the normal range in the low 20s. Uh, and also based on a large validation study, the 18% cutoff was the best cutoff value, and so that was the cutoff that we selected. Uh, LA strain is less accurate in certain diseases, for example, primary mitral regurgitation. Uh, it is affected by other hemodynamic variables. It is less accurate in heart transplant recipients, does not relate to pressure. There, it is also um, less accurate uh, in atrial fibrillation. Um, but we the writing group believes that the time has come for labs to acquire it routinely and for physicians 
to think about it and use it in the context of what else is going on. If uh, the lead doesn't have LA strain, you can think of pulmonary vein systolic diastolic flow ratios as a poor man's look at LA strain. Uh, and so uh, if you put both signals together, the ability to draw inferences about LA pressure goes up even if you're missing one of these two signals, provided the other is there. I know one of the concerns after the uh, 2016 guidelines came out was that a fair number of patients fell in the indeterminate category, although the 2016 guidelines really made an effort to simplify assessment with the pathways that were provided, but, but that did leave some as being indeterminate. Do you think that the with the current guidelines, indeterminate will be much less of a problem? Absolutely. Um... In general, one can look at the algorithm that is now uh, the new one in the update, in the 2025 update, as a first tier of variables that have a high feasibility. But then if they do not come across or they fall in ranges uh, where we cannot be sure, there is a second tier of variables that are recommended. And these include left atrial strain, pulmonary vein flow signals, um, isovolumic relaxation time, left atrial maximum volume index, looking at pulmonary regurgitation, and diastolic velocity and PA diastolic pressure estimation, uh, looking at the L velocity that may be recorded in the mitral uh, inflow, looking at changes in mitral inflow with Belzava. So there is a whole list of things that one can go one by one. The key, the key part, however, is during scanning these patients, one has to be compulsive and get the signals and get high quality signals. We tested the issue of indeterminate compared to the 2016 and the yield is minimal. Excellent, that is great. Tell us a little bit about when you'd get a stress echo. I know that's in the guidelines too. Uh, yes, um, so it is in, the issue of stress echo is brought within the main uh, algorithm for LAP estimation and is also brought up in the section on uh, diagnosing patients with heart failure preserved ejection fraction. Uh, so the in the first group of uh, cases or in the first set of uh, presentations, if someone has normal left atrial pressure at baseline but has evidence diastolic dysfunction, primarily reduced annular velocities for age. Uh, these are the type of patients where one should recommend a stress echocardiogram. We believe it should be included. We, the writing group members, believe it should be included in the report. So the referring physician would have guidance as what would be the next step. Um, the second piece, again, is in somebody having symptoms uh, of heart failure but their left atrial pressure is normal uh, at baseline, the stress echo uh, should be recommended as the next step. And if they meet the criteria uh, of a normally elevated left atrial pressure with exercise, that would be sufficient to establish the diagnosis uh, of heart failure preserved ejection fraction without the need for cardiac catheterization. I presume you've already implemented these new recommendations at Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. Um, so uh, they have, nothing has sort of uh, been released till it is public available, but uh, the feasibility of the different signals um, with many of the writing group members have been experimenting with them with their labs. So we are comfortable uh, that what we are saying can indeed be updated. How often do you think how, if if a laboratory does a comprehensive um, method, methodical assessment of diastolic function, including stress echo as needed and all the recommendations in the guidelines, how often do you think one would need to resort to um, cardiac catheterization to assess diastolic function and have, have diagnosis? I think the yield, the need for the cardiac catheterization should be low, but the caveats are a comprehensive, high quality exam, the need to do the stress echocardiogram, which is also done with high quality. 
if one doesn't pay attention to these two, then we may end up with values that do not match clinical presentation for which a cath would be appropriate. Um, I think labs uh, in, uh, should go through these guidelines and should look at what signals they are comfortable acquiring, what signals they do not routinely acquire, uh, what is their performance from quality metrics for the stress echocardiograms, uh, to sort of increase, if you would, the confidence in the echo lab assessment of patients with uh, shortness of breath symptoms. And that will get them more reference, hopefully. Well, thanks for visiting with me and thank you for all your work on these excellent guidelines and for publishing them in JACE. Thank you. I uh, thanking uh, ASE for the opportunity to work on this along with my co-chair, Dr. Danita Samborn, and all the writing group members. I do not want to miss anyone, so I'm not going to mention them uh, name by name, but Dr. O, Dr. Klein, Dr. Derumo, Dr. Otto Smethes played a big, a huge role, uh, particularly with the validation piece, all the sonographer members that I have mentioned, Dr. Amil Shah, and Dr. Teresa Tsang with the AI section. If for others, if I did not mention your name, please forgive me, but it's a, a lot of work from many colleagues uh, over a good number of months. Yes, indeed. Thanks again, and thanks for visiting with me today. Thank you, Dr. Pellick.